is very, very quiet. I'm hunting whoopals. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier, and today we're having a look at a piece of firearms technology that, until fairly recently, I didn't even know existed. So when I was out at the range shooting the rifle grenade video, I came across a number of these strange cartridges lying on the ground. Now, at first I assumed that these were flares or perhaps some kind of 410 or 28 gauge shotgun shell, but when I took one of these home and measured it, I found that it didn't quite match the dimensions of either of those shotgun gauges. So became very curious and did a little bit of digging and finally found out what this is for. So this is known as a fire stick, and this was introduced early in 2020 by the Federal Ammunition Company. And Federal describes this as the latest development in, of all things, muzzle-loading technology. So in most jurisdictions, the hunting season is divided up not only according to what type of game you can hunt, but also what kind of weapons you can hunt it with. So for example, some seasons will be reserved for modern cartridge firing rifles, whereas others will be so-called primitive hunting seasons where you can only use weapons like a bow and arrow or a muzzle-loading rifle. So muzzle-loader hunting and shooting in general really never went away, but it saw a huge resurgence in popularity in the 1970s, uh, thanks in part, apparently, to the 1972 film Jeremiah Johnson starring Robert Redford. And at first, most of the muzzle-loading firearms sold were reproductions of classic flintlocks, like this one, or percussion lock rifles, like this one. And in both cases, the reloading procedure would have been pretty much the same. So you would take out a powder measure and you would pour a pre-measured charge of black powder into the muzzle of the rifle. You would then take your projectile, which would either be a round musket ball or a conical minier style ball like this one, uh, wrap it with a, a grease cloth patch, put it in the muzzle, pull out your ramrod from under the barrel, and ram the projectile down to the rear of the chamber so that it seats against the powder charge. Then, if you have a percussion lock rifle, you would open up the hammer, put on a percussion cap, a uh, primer here, and then you'd be ready to go. Or in the case of a flintlock rifle like this one, you would pull the cock to half cock, put a little bit of priming powder in the pan, close the frizzen, pull the cock back to full cock, and then you'd be ready to go. But as muzzleloader hunting and shooting became ever more popular, the firearms evolved along with them, and you started to see the emergence of so-called inline muzzleloaders. So inline muzzle loaders are almost exclusively percussion lock rifles, only instead of having the percussion cap nipple and the hammer on the side, as is traditional, these are moved to the center line of the barrel, hence the name. So the nipple will protrude out the rear of the chamber and is typically part of a threaded breech plug, which you can thread out so you can clean the nipple and also swab out the barrel using a cleaning rod. It'll also have a more centerfire style central hammer or even sometimes a linear striker or firing pin to activate the primer. And a lot of these rifles are very modern in that they have polymer rather than traditional wood furniture, uh, more modern iron sights with fiber optics or even rails for mounting optics. But despite all of these advancements, inline muzzle loaders have a lot of disadvantages that are really inherent to muzzle loaders as a whole. For example, it's sometimes very difficult to get your powder charge right. Most rifles will come with a recommended powder charge that you want to stick to, but if you're experimenting around, it's very easy to underload or overload the rifle. And you know this can lead to several problems, including lack of accuracy, or if you're seriously overloading, the rifle can lead to serious safety concerns. Black powder is also very sensitive to the weather. Uh, black powder is traditionally composed of charcoal, sulfur, and potassium nitrate, or saltpeter. And potassium nitrate is very hygroscopic. It absorbs water from the atmosphere. So if you're shooting in very damp conditions, your powder can very easily get wet and fail to fire. And as a side note, if you're firing a flintlock firearm and you get a misfire, that's typically known as a flash in the pan. And that's the origin of that particular term. 
Uh, also, if you get a misfire or say you're out hunting and you don't end up discharging your rifle and you want to unload it, uh, this is often very difficult because the barrel ends in a dead end at the chamber. And so there's really no way of getting your powder and your projectile out from the rear. So typically what you have to do is get yourself what's known as a gun worm, which is a corkscrew that attaches to the end of your cleaning rod, shove that down the barrel, screw into the soft lead of the projectile and yank it out, then pour out the powder. Uh, so all of those disadvantages are actually what the fire stick was intended to address. So the fire stick was invented by Federal Ammunition in partnership with Traditions, which is a uh, manufacturer of modern muzzle-loading firearms. And this is meant to be used in conjunction with a specially designed rifle called the Traditions Nitro Fire. So the fire stick is really just a self-contained black powder cartridge, like a big blank. So it's plastic, it contains around 100 to 120 grains of black powder and is sealed at both ends and has a little well in the back for inserting a standard primer. And the Nitro Fire rifle looks like a normal inline muzzle loader, except that the barrel can actually tilt, it breaks open almost like a shotgun to reveal a rear chamber. And how you would reload it is like with a normal muzzle loader, you would ram your bullet down the barrel with your ramrod, and then you would crack open the chamber, insert your fire stick, insert your primer, and then close the rifle. And there's actually a little metal ring, a shelf, that separates the chamber from the bullet so that it still counts legally as a muzzle loader. You can't actually load both projectile and the fire stick from the rear. And according to Federal, there are a number of advantages to this. Number one, you don't have to worry about measuring out your powder. Each cartridge has a consistent amount of powder. It's very reliable. You'll get a reliable amount of accuracy out of each shot. Second, it's waterproof. So you don't have to worry about the weather uh, making your powder damp and creating misfires. And finally, it's very easy to unload. Say if you get a misfire or if you didn't fire your rifle and you want to unload it, you simply crack it open, pull out your fire stick, and then you can use a cleaning rod or a ramrod to push the bullet back out through the muzzle of the barrel. Now, to my mind, the nitro fire and the fire stick are an example of what you might call loophole abuse because they really stretch the definition of muzzle loader almost to its breaking point. After all, the only difference between the nitro fire and a regular breech loading break action rifle is that thin metal disc, that shelf that separates the fire stick from the projectile. Get rid of that and it just becomes a regular rifle with two-part ammunition. And indeed, a lot of jurisdictions in the United States are actively debating whether this really counts as a muzzleloader, whether it represents enough of a challenge or a handicap to be considered a form of primitive hunting. And, you know, a couple of states have approved it for hunting, others are still actively debating it, Others haven't gotten around to it, so it's still something that's up for debate. But either way, I still find it fascinating just like how far you can stretch uh, that technical definition and just how close you can get to crossing over from muzzle loader to breech loader without crossing the line. It's kind of like all of those firearms that were designed after the assault weapons ban in the United States that you know, abuse all sorts of loopholes in the law and come just so close to breaking the law, but don't. And, you know, this is the story with a lot of uh, different technical developments throughout history. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. A bit of a short one today, but I couldn't resist pulling this out and uh, showing you the rather unique purpose it was designed for and talking about recent developments in muzzle-loading technology, of all things. Very old technology, the original firearms technology is still going strong today and still a fertile ground for innovation, as you can see. Um, I was very interested to find out what this thing was actually for, and I hope you had fun learning as well. Anyway, I'll see you next time on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities, where we'll look at more fascinating artifacts just like this one. Until then, thank you for watching. I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.